Prepare yourself for the terror. The prison of madness where few enter and none return. Welcome to Unsung Horrors. With Lance. And Erica. Leave all your sanity behind. It can't help you now. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Unsung Horrors, the podcast where we discuss underseen horror films, specifically those with fewer than 1,000 views on Letterboxd. I'm Lance. And I'm Erica. We have to start this episode with some exciting news to check in on an update uh. <laughs> of your ongoing crowdfunding campaign that's it's currently active on Indiegogo, and that's for your film reference book that you've written which was announced last episode. Yes. The Sweetest Taboo, An Unapologetic Guide to Child Kills in Film. It's my favorite thing ever. It is. How's it going? What's it's going really well. Apparently, a lot of other people like this this in films, too. Yes. Not, not as much as me. I love all of you who've backed this, but I'm, i got to say this. Nobody loves watching this stuff as much as I do. Uh, yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. I think. You wrote um, a book about it. Yeah. <laughs> it is. No, it's, it's been an extremely overwhelming week. I was not expecting this much support right off the bat. And I know a lot of our listeners have pitched in. So thank you to all of you who have. I hit 100% of the goal within 24 hours. Yes, I'm currently at 143% of the goal. I'm shooting for 200% at this point, because that means that I can essentially double the the amount of books that I was planning on printing for this, which wasn't going to be that much in the first place. Mm -hmm. Um, Oh, it's it's a lot, and uh, yeah, I'm I'm just super grateful to everyone who's who's been so supportive of this. You know, we were on Anthony's podcast on on Sunday to talk about another Roger Corman movie. So if you haven't listened to that already, go check it out. Yeah, and um, I got to be on the Disconnected YouTube channel with Ryan and talk about the book and talk about my favorite kind of child kill or any type type of kill really in a movie. And that's vehicles. Nice. Um, so I'll link that. Uh, I'll link both of those in show notes for folks to check out. Um, we'll also have a link to the Indiegogo. So if you haven't pitched in already, you can, uh, you can pitch in 10, 15 bucks. If you want to just not get a copy of the book, that's totally fine. Or if you're in Austin, you can choose the level and pick up the book in person, not have to pay for shipping. But most folks have been going with the Jaws level because that's the one for, you know, U.S. residents. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know I did get called out on Twitter because I wasn't offering a option for anyone outside of the initial countries I set up because I just had initially set it up based on our listeners um, and like which countries we have the most listeners in. So I put us, Canada, the UK, Australia, New Zealand. Right. And, um, you know, I got called out from Mark in Switzerland. Hi, Mark. And, <laughs> and was like, Hey, yeah, I want a copy. What about me? And, uh, so I, you know, worked it out with him. So if you are a listener in another country and there's not an option for you available, just go to the campaign, click on the ask a question button that will email me and we will definitely be able to work something out. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. No, I had no doubt that, that it would be successful because you get back what you give and you're very, I know you don't like compliments. I like don't. Stop it. Your way. Stop it. But yeah, no, I'm just, I'm glad that the goal's been blown out of the water. Um, I think it's going to be amazing. Thank so you. congratulations on the success. Yeah. And if you all aren't following Lance, he did tease the comic that he's drawing for it. And I'm really excited. For yeah. That. I heard there's a comic book in there. It's going to be great. <laughs> That's, I mean, everybody should be backing this book. Uh, I also wanted to talk briefly about some of the movies we've seen in the theater lately. Mm -hmm. So some great programming that's happening here in Austin, you know, early in the year, specifically for me, uh, you know, Albert Pune passed away last November yeah. and Laird Jimenez uh, programmed a month of Albert Pune movies for weird Wednesday. Three of the four movies are 35 millimeter print, which is just amazing to think yeah. about. Uh, first week in January was captain America, which was not a 35 millimeter print, but I had not seen that and I went and attended that and that was just I a can't blast. Imagine. That that had to be so much fun. It was. Uh, and then last week was Radioactive Dreams, the 35 millimeter print star. You know, it's such a wild movie yeah. with Michael Dudikoff and John Stockwell. 
I just thank the galaxies for Laird, like putting together an Albert, a month of Albert Pune <laughs> movies yeah. programming uh, in Austin because, you know, he's not for everybody. You know, a lot of people don't like his movies I'm, or just watch them to make fun of. But yeah. no matter what, you have to like respect his passion and the yeah. work he put into his his movies. But. Yeah, 100%. Nothing but respect for him. I I, I even... So Laird had mentioned to me that he was programming a month of Albert Pion because he, he messaged me um, and to let me know, hey, there's a kid death in Radioactive Dreams. And he saw I, I didn't have it yet. And um, so thank you, Laird, for that, too. Well, Laird also put that trailer together. So if you watch that, that's all him. He is fucking amazing. The sweetest taboo yeah. tra- book trailer. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, I didn't go to that screening because I watched it because I needed to finish my write-up for that beforehand. And my write-up is basically like, I'm not, I'm not really a fan of this movie, but honestly, it's me. It's not, right. it's not Pian. I know it's me. I have nothing but respect for the man, but I just don't get down with his movies. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it, it's mainly my love for him started with Doll Man. Oh, which that's, is, of course. Yeah. You know, if you had to pick a perfect Albert Pian movie, <laughs> it's Doll Man, I think. <laughs> uh, a lot of people love Radioactive Dreams, uh, which I totally get. Um yeah, it's just a kitchen sink movie. A lot of his stuff is. He just kind of swings for the fences and yeah. everything. Uh, but yeah, there's there's some upcoming. I think Cyborg's next, and then Alien from L.A. is the last week. I mm-hmm. think I'm going to miss those because I have some Terror Tuesdays lined up. But yeah, just wanted to call out that special programming yeah. in Austin. Way to go, Laird. Way to go. Have you seen anything recently at the theater? I know we're gonna we're gonna see a cool thirty five millimeter print, hopefully of World on a Wire. Uh, tomorrow. The yeah tomorrow. tomorrow yeah yeah you're going to both right? Part I am yeah. So they AFS split it yeah yeah Austin Film Society. So it's one movie for the price of two, but that's fine. Yeah, it's presented in a way where I guess it was initially aired in nineteen seventy three on German television, which is really it's over two hundred minutes long. So like you know the price for mission makes sense, right? But. Uh, I can't wait to see that on 35 millimeter. Yeah. I'm super excited for that. Yeah. John and I went to go see um, Sunset Boulevard at uh, at Alamo a couple days ago. And I hadn't seen it since college. So it was great to revisit that. Nice. What else? Oh, it was Friday the 13th yesterday. So um, Alamo was playing part six, which whatever. I'm so indifferent to the Friday the 13th franchise. But I will say that I did rewatch because John wanted to, um, Jason goes to hell. Yeah. And I was like, why does this have a 1.8 rating? This is stupid fun. <laughs> What's wrong with you people? <laughs> it is stupid fun. I mean, did you like Jason X? Is that, that's a, the, the Jason in space one. That's the Jason in space one. I, I wouldn't go as far as to say I like it. I, I had, I had fun with it, but I think it's a little, it goes a little too far for me. Yeah. You know, I, I think this one is where it start. Part six is kind of where it starts to go there. And I'm fine with that. But like full camp, Jason is like, eh, I am already not fully invested in this. So I'm not really that interested. So, right. Yeah. 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 I mean, I have, I have fun with most, most of the Friday the 13th series, but there are, there are some duds personally for me. Yeah. I think it's part three. I don't like 3d and I don't like, is it part seven? The new, the, the one psychic? with the psychic one, yeah. Oh, you one. don't like that one? That's that's a lot of people's favorite. Is it? I mean, part f- the part five is. Uh, yeah, I don't. Even you do know. you, Lance? Though you do yeah, you. I'll do. I'll do me. Yeah. Okay, so let's jump into our movie. It's still Giallo January. It's my pick. Yes. Libido from 1965. Uh, it currently has 550 views on Letterboxd. If you haven't seen it, there's an English dubbed version on Tubi. I prefer the Italian subtitled version, Mm -hmm. uh, which you can find on YouTube. And Severin also has their Blu-ray release uh, that came out, I think it was July or it was, it was middle of 2022, which includes some really strong special features, which, which we'll be chatting about. Uh, So libido, it's about a man named Christian who experienced a traumatic event as a young child, which was watching his father brutally murder a woman in his house and then commit suicide afterwards by jumping off a cliff into the water. Uh, Although his body was never found, only a bloody shirt was retrieved. And so Christian, the young kid, uh, returns 20 years later to the house, which is basically a castle or a large villa, with his fiancée Eileen and another couple, Paul, the family estate caretaker or the guardian, and his wife, Brigitte. 
Christian and his companions are back to work on the house, or they go back to the house, uh, which he's set to inherit. And they all go there to kind of uh, fix up the house because he's going to inherit, inherit it in a few months on his 25th birthday. But he's also there to kind of confront his fears, essentially. So while at the house, he's plagued by these memories and visions of his father. And Christian has concerns that he may be insane like his father. And he's questioning his own mental stability. And those few around him seem to be playing into that. It's looking like they have something to do with these visions he's having and possibly planning to somehow take his inheritance. Uh, and then we'll obviously jump in on spoilers. This is Giallo January, but we always spoil movies. So, yeah. you know, nothing new there. So libido kind of came about from an argument. Producer Luciano Martino, who's, you know, the Martino brothers, mm -hmm. Sergio Martino is the director. Uh, Luciano, I'm sorry, Luciano Martino is uh, the producer of the brothers. And this movie kind of started off as a bet. It came from an argument between Luciano and another Italian producer, Mino Loy. Loy's argument was to be a good director, you had to be technical. And Luciano Martino's argue, argument was that to be a good director, you'd have to be good with storytelling and the story itself. And Gastaldi was there and overheard this argument. So he kind of jumped at the opportunity to prove Luciano right. And he's like, yeah, let's try having me direct this mo a movie. So, you know, Luciano helped, you know, fund this. It's very shoestring budget. But uh, this is Gastaldi's, Ernesto Gastaldi's the director. Vittoria Salerno is also the co-director. This is Gastaldi and, and Salerno's first directorial debut. Gastaldi was 25 years when he when he directed this. They used a, it's the director is credited as a single name, which is Julian Barry Storff. Ernesto Gastaldi had already been using the name Julian Barry. He was a sci he wrote science fiction novels. So he used Julian Barry. And then Salerno chose Storff being his mother's maiden name. So the, cre the director credit is Julian Barry Storff on, uh, on this. Uh, Gastaldi and Salerno, they co-directed another film together called Screams in the Night in 1981, which you recently watched. I did. I'm going to save my, my discussion about that film until we actually get into this, to the discussion of the film. Okay. Um, I want to save it for, for then because Screams in the Night has a lot in common with Libido. Like a lot, like so much so that it's, you could go as far as to call it a sequel. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I'll talk Gastal about that. We'll uh, yeah. Sense. Okay, cool. Yeah. I think Gasaldi actually called it a sequel of sorts, kind of like a what if film, but yeah, I want to yeah. hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. What if is, yeah, it's probably more, that's probably a more apt description of it is a what if film. Cool. Yeah. Ernesto Gastaldo, Gastaldi directed uh, only two other films um, on his own, Cheers to Cyanide in 1968 and The Lonely Violent Beach in 1971, which we both watched. Yeah. Uh, it was okay. I mean, yeah. It's I mean, okay. <laughs> Libido is definitely the movie to watch uh, yeah. from, from his uh, directorial filmography. But Gastaldi did, he asked Vittorio Salerno to help him direct this movie. Like I said, he was only 25 years old. He had never directed before. He wanted a little bit of help, but one of the main reasons that he did approach Vittorio was because uh, Vittorio had a brother who was at the time a very famous, a very well-known, highly paid actor, Enrico Maria Saler Salerno. He's from Bird with the Crystal, Crystal Plumage, Night Train Murders, Savage Three. Mm -hmm. Very great, you know, recognizable Italian actor. And uh, Gastaldi basically said, like, you know, if you can land your brother this role, the role of Paul, which we'll, who we'll talk about, uh, Luciano Pagazzi played, Pagazzi, that'd be great that, you know, this would help. We don't have to pay him that much. If you can talk to him, it's blood. So Enrico agreed uh, to play the part, but he wanted to make changes to the character of Paul, like making him half blind and paralyzed. He had all these suggestions for the character. Hmm. And Gastaldi quickly realized he does not want this part. You know, he's just... He wants to help his brother out, but not really that much. Yeah. So they moved on and they ended up going with uh, Pagazzi. And at that point, Vittorio was so invested into the film that he did also co-direct with Gastaldi. Um, as far as Vittorio Salerno goes, I think it could be argued that he's probably the stronger director between Gastaldi and, mm. uh, and himself. 
Uh, there's one movie that I've seen of his that I absolutely love. That's The Savage Three oh. from 1975. Yeah, that one's great. That's in the Years of Lead box set from Arrow. If you, folks don't have it, yes, or it's probably playing on the Arrow Channel too. It probably is on Arrow Player. Yeah, like most of their stuff that's released. But uh, yeah, about a group of friends who commit these random acts of violence just kind of for the fun of it. Very dark, very bleak. Uh, I love the way it's shot, and that was just Vittorio Salerno doing the directing. Um, he also directed No, the Case is Happily Resolved in 1973. Uh, Libido was written by Gastaldi. Well, its credit is written by Gastaldi, Vittorio Salerno, and uh, Mara Merrill, who also plays one of the lead roles in Libido. Brigitte. Brigitte, yeah. Um, and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll talk about her a little bit sp- more specifically in a moment. But uh, in an interview, Gastaldi claims that Salerno didn't make any changes to the completed script that him and Mara worked on. So he just, he kind of was just credited. But if some listeners have never really heard the name Ernesto Gastaldi, I know we brought him up when we had Troy on on the last episode. Mm-hmm. Um, he's kind of an unsung hero of, you know, Italian cinema. He's... I'm positive you've seen some of the films he's written. The guy is a master, uh, especially of the giallo genre, but also horror, westerns, a uh, little bit of everything. And I'm just going to list off a few. Yeah, I think he, he's he's unsung in the sense of like, the, especially in like the director's seat. But and and I think also um, writers don't generally get a spotlight on them. It's always the directors or the stars. Um, or yeah, if you're a director who's writing your exactly. own. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or the compose, I feel like even the composer even gets more credit, but if you watch enough Italian movies, you see his name pop up. So even if you don't know, you know, exactly. Yeah. It's, I think it's a name that should be, you know, more prominent and known in Italian yeah. film for sure. Yeah. Uh, he wrote torso torso. Torso. All the colors of the dark. Your vice is a locked room and only I have the key. The suspicious death of a minor. The long hair of death. So sweet, so perverse. Death walks on high heels. Some of his older gothic step, Crypt of the Vampire. The Sergio Leone produced Western My Name is Nobody. Great Lee Van Cleef movies, Day of Anger, The Grand, Grand Duel. Lindsay's Almost Human. The Horrible Dr. Hitchcock. He wrote Savage 3 that Salerno directed. So, so many movies. Yeah. Spoiler, folks, I did not pick The Horrible Dr. Hitchcock for my double feature. What? But necrophilia. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was figuring like this might be anything that has necrophilia or yeah. a child death. Yeah. Almost Human just got announced in Severin's new box set, the uh, Milan Lenzi yes. box set. Yeah. I'm. I'm on the fence on whether I'm going to get it or not because I have three of the, no, four of those films on Blu-ray already. So it's kind of hard for me to justify. Yeah. So. I mean, I think Severin's special features are kind yeah. of a step above most. Uh, I mean, not that they're, I'm saying I'm right. you know, pulling shade on anybody else, of but course. I love their special features. And I think that's, that's one of the biggest drives to get these type of sets. Yeah. We'll see. I'll probably convince myself at some point. <laughs> yeah, I, I haven't pulled the trigger on that either yet. But uh, yeah. but all of those movies are just bangers. Everything on this Ernest, Ernesto Gastaldo list is just banger after banger. And a lot of this, these films we've talked about in many episodes, either in passing, mm-hmm. double feature recommendations. Uh, you can't, you just can't go wrong watching something he has his name on. Yeah. So yeah, the score. You said the score. You know, gets a lot. Scores usually get more love than a lot of the writers uh, in, in in Italian horror and gialli. So, Carlo Rusticelli did the original score, or Rusticelli. He's a Mario Bava regular. He did the score for um, Blood and Black Lace, Kill Baby Kill, Whip in the Body, as well as The Long Hair of Death and Divorce Italian Style. And it's an interesting score for libido. Gastaldi in an interview said he didn't work with uh, Rusticelli at all during the production. The score was basically him, Carlo doing his own thing. And that was kind of, I mean, Gastaldi said that Rusticelli knew what he's doing. He's, he was an established composer at that point, but also he didn't pay him a dime, very shoestring budget budget. And they didn't pay him at all. The And that was so he had complete creative control. And also he got to keep the rights to all his music. But yeah, the music in this has kind of like at times like a Jaws buildup for tension and stuff. But then it has a lot of weird, you know, jazz moments leaning hard into some kind of jazz melodies, which you see pop up in a lot of later Giallo films. But I like it all in all. 
his score in libido, I don't think is, it doesn't like stand out. It's like fine. there's nothing like it. I, I heard in the very beginning, I'm like, oh, this is kind of like a cool Jaws theme. And I don't remember. I did like at times I was uh, thinking like there seems to be a, a lot of music in this. Like it's kind of, and I don't know if that's because he was signed off to kind of do his own thing and add the elements he wanted. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, there's a lot, a lot of music covering uh, this movie, which is great. Yeah. Uh, as far as other crew members, Gastaldi was forced to create fake random names for the work he did, editing, set design, cos costume design. Uh, so he created, you know, other pseudonyms. He used George Money as editor, which was himself. And for art direction and costume design, he simply used Dick. Yep. <laughs> I screenshot that, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good, that's gotta be a pose. <laughs> uh, and then his wife, Mara Merrill was, she was the costume and wardrobe department for the movie. She went by An Angie Travel and she created that cat bikini by herself. She designed all that. That cat, that cat bikini, man. That's it's amazing. It is the greatest thing ever. Yeah. I mean, she, she used her own clothes. Uh, same with the other main actress, Dominique Boscaro. Uh, mm -hmm. She used her own clothes as well. But yeah. Mara Merrill did the did the wardrobe for everybody else. So there's the cast. It's a very minimal cast. There's only four characters in this. First, we have the great Giancarlo Giannini playing Christian, mm -hmm. the lead character. Uh, this is his first film acting credit. He's credited as John Charlie Johns. And due to having a very small budget, Gastaldo and Salerno wanted to, you know, find a young lead aspiring actor cheap. So they contacted a few ta talent agencies and two names made the cut. Uh, Giancarlo Giannini and Franco Nero. Of course. <laughs> of course. Each had auditions at Gastaldi's house and Gastaldi claims he chose Giannini after uh, this is, I think this was more of a kind of a joke in his interview, but he chose Giannini after uh, Franco Nero claimed that he was a very sensitive actor. He f had feelings and stuff. Although he may look kind of masculine, he was very sensitive. Mm -hmm. And Gastaldi jokingly is like, let's go with the other guy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he, I mean, he, he said he really liked Giannini's big eyes and the role and the fact that he wasn't muscular at all uh, at that time Franco Nero was. Yeah. He became Django like the following year. Uh, obviously, they both blew up. I mean, what can you say? Like, if you had that, that's just an amazing final cut of two <laughs> lead act Italian actors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we've talked about Franco Nero being, you know, amazing and and so recognizable. But Gianni, Giancarlo Giannini is also a very recognizable face in cinema, not only in Italian but from all over the world. Uh, I started watching some of his earlier work for this podcast and his uh, Lena Wertmuller films. Yeah. Uh, Love and Anarchy, Seven Beauties, which he, he received an Oscar nomination mm -hmm. for in 1977, I think it was. Uh, Swept Away, The Seduction of Mimi. I mean, he is, I think he produced some of those as well. And he is so, he's like a silent actor in those movies. His expressions are just so animated. A lot, most of these are streaming on Kino Cult right now, so I can't wait to kind of dive more into these in, in this coming year. But yeah. they're all kind of these dark comedies. Yeah, he just dominates the screen in those. Um, he was a, he had a recurring character in the last Daniel Craig Bond run, playing Rene Mathis in Casino Royale and Quantum of Solace. Mm. He starred in uh, the Italian Giallo, The Black Belly of the Tarantula from 1971. Uh, awesome Morricone score for that, speaking of scores. Uh, he stole the show. I recently watched this for the first time, but I watched Hannibal, the 2001 sequel <laughs> <laughs> to Silence of the Lambs. Oh my God. And he plays uh, an Italian inspector. He basically locates the missing Hannibal Lecter. Right. Doesn't he get like gutted and, and yeah. hanged? He gets hanged and then completely the gutted. Yeah. Okay, like his yeah. intestine. Like it's, he stole the picture for me though. I mean, well, yeah. How can he not? Look at that man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of people would recognize him as being older and kind of this, you know, kind of rugged looking. Yeah. He's still like a very good looking older man. But oh, yeah. when you see him mm -hmm. in Libido or even these Wertmuller movies, he's just kind of baby face. Like it, it's funny to watch him just progress. Yeah. You know, other performances, he was in Guillermo de Toro's Mimic, which I think had a child death. It does, yes. They get killed by the Judas cockroaches, whatever they're called. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Man on Fire, Tony Scott, 
Uh, he directed two features on his own, a comedy in 1987 called The Numbers Game, and then a thriller in uh, 2013 called The Gambler Who Wouldn't Die, which I'm interested in checking out. Hmm. Uh, but aside from you know acting roles, he had a great career and still does as a voice actor, being the official Italian voice dubber of Al Pacino. Uh, Giannini also dubbed Jack Nicholson's voice in The Shining, the Italian release of Kubrick's Shining, and uh, as Nicholson's Joker in Batman, Tim Burton's Batman. But he's dubbed voices for Dustin Hoffman, Ian McKellen, Jeremy Irons. And when I read Jeremy Irons, I was like, because when I first watched Libido, I was like, "What? Who does Janini, John Car- a young Giancarlo Janini look like?" And he looked like Jeremy Irons to me, a young Jeremy mm. Irons. Yeah, but yeah, so many voice dubbing uh, acting roles, very successful. So he came from the theater. He came from stage acting. So he was when he was hired, he was very concerned that he would be overacting in this role, his very first feature role. Mm-hmm. So he told Gastaldi and Salerno to really hold him back, you know, to make sure he's not. Just keep him in check because he's he's going to go wild, which he does. I mean, some people could say he is overacting in this, but I think he's fantastic in this role. Um, it does remind me of, which was kind of funny too, given the circumstances of the casting, but Franco Nero from The Third Eye. Yeah. Very, a lot of screaming, a lot of crying, good stuff. So one other fun fact about Giannini, he has this sort of like, side hobby that I found out about. So I went down this rabbit hole. Um, yeah. So you know what I'm, where I'm going with this? So yeah, I do. I, do. I, looked up, I looked up an interview that he did and he mentioned in passing um, that he was very sad about the passing of Robin Williams. Yes. And I was like, what? That's ra- okay. And I'm like, did he voice act for him? And then read further into it. And apparently he designed the gadget jacket for Robin Williams in that movie toys from 1992. Yeah. Now I'm going to go with the assumption that he had actually originally designed a full suit that was a gadget thing, but that Robin Williams could not keep the pants on around Giannini. (laughs) And so they just used the suit jacket, just the electric coat. Yeah. Yeah. No pants folks. Yeah. That, that makes sense. But yeah, to expand on that, he he was uh, big into gadgets. He went to, um, he got a diploma, he studied and received a diploma in electronic engineering in Naples before he started acting, Yeah, or I think while he was stage acting. But uh, we'll talk about the main prop in, in Libido, which is a Jiminy Cricket doll, this wind-up toy. Mm-hmm. Uh, he created and built that, which is... Amazing to to think about. Ob- obviously, saved a lot of money for Gastaldi and Salerno. Yeah, but. it's amazing. But also, the first time it popped up on screen, I thought it was a penis with a top hat. <laughs> <laughs> and then I looked closer, and I was like, "Is that Mister Peanut?" And then John was like, "It's Jiminy Cricket, or it's the cricket from Pinocchio, yeah. or whatever." I, I I honestly had no idea it was a cricket at first too. I thought okay. it was like some weird Eggman, like just a weird character okay. toy. Uh, I mean, my mind went fast. I didn't. First, I didn't but. go to the penis right away. <laughs> uh, I was too busy looking at Giancarlo. Right? I, I should mean, have yeah. thought of penis right away. <laughs> but yeah, a funny story about that is that apparently, like after, like during production, that that toy, no shade on on Janini's engineering <laughs> work, but apparently it broke during. It wouldn't like do the the lifting of the hat. Oh. And Gastaldi's like, oh, but well, we'll make it work. But yeah, he's he's an inventor. He's an inventor of gadgets as well, besides not only being an awesome actor. Mm. Next, we have Dominique Boscaro playing Janini's wife, Eileen. Uh, Unlike most of the cast and crew, Boscaro kept her real name. She was an established actor. She's really only the major established actor in this this, uh, small cast. So everybody else had pseudonyms except her. Uh, She's also a face that people might be familiar with in Italian horror um, and in Gialli having roles in Who Saw or Die, uh, Sergio Martino's All the Colors of the Dark, The Iguana with the Tongue of Fire, The Bloodstained Lawn. Uh, physically, she reminded me of, of, and you know, I don't like, I mean, I do it a lot. I compare like physical looks to people, but uh, Rumi Rapaz from, you know, Dr. Shaw from Prometheus. I kept seeing her. Is it Rumi? Yeah, it's Numi, isn't it? I thought you said Rumi. And I was like, what? <laughs> no, <laughs> Numi Rapay. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so like they they physically like I, I love her uh in Prometheus especially, but I kept seeing a lot of their same features. I can see that. Yeah. And then we have Luciano Pagazzi plays Paul. Mm-hmm. 
he's the caretaker of the house or the guardian of the family's estate. And Pagazzi's probably, I think, the most recognizable. I mean, Giannini is too, but I think he's the most recognizable yeah. uh, face that pops up in this. Uh, he's typically credited as Alan Collins, which he is in, in this film and in a lot of other Italian films. He's also known as the Italian Peter Lorre. He has a, a look. Good Lord, yes. To him. <laughs> uh, he has a face a lot uh, like Italian actor uh, Eduardo Calvo, who's in Dragonfly. He plays a professor. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It, they have this guilty look to them. Like, they're perfect for Gialli because they're, they're just a red herring. Like, as soon as they pop up on screen, even if they're just walking in the background, they're going to be like, that's the fucking killer. <laughs> Uh, and Bugazzi has that face, but he's been in a lot of Bava movies, Blood and Black Lace, The Whip in the Body, Hatchet for the Honeymoon, Barren Blood. Uh, he's all, he was also in The Colors of the Dark, Seven Deaths in the, the Cat's Eye, the Antonio Margaretti, the very messy, but so very fun, Zombie oh, 3. <laughs> he has a small role in The Case of the Bloody Iris, uh, which is another another one written by Gastaldi. Uh, and God said to Cain, he's in a lot of Lindsay films, the tough ones, uh, also known as Rome Armed to the Teeth, Syndicate Sadists, basically just a ton of Italian action spaghetti at Westerns, over 100 film credits. He just has a great face for, for cinema. And then lastly, we have Mara Merrill, who plays Pagazzi's, Pagazzi's character's uh, wife, Brigitte. Which uh, was, this is a character, Gastaldi said she created all on her own, which, you know, is why she has the co-writing uh, credit. Um, her pseudonym for the film is Mara Merrill. Uh, her real name was Mara Chianetti, but uh, she married Ernesto Gastaldo in 1960, and they remained married until uh, her fairly recent death in September 2021. 20, uh, mm. Yeah, as mentioned, she co-wrote Libido with him, as well as a few other films, um, including the great... Sergio Martino, The Scorpion with Two Tails, which is <laughs> just fantastic. And it's <laughs> okay. a mess, uh, which, you know, whatever. It's a, it, that's a sore, sore subject for you because I know you don't like how people react to John Saxon. That was unforgivable. <laughs> uh, Meryl also co-wrote The Great Alligator, another Martino film, and another with Ernesto Gastaldi, directed film called Cheers to Cyanide. She acted in all of Gastaldi's films, by the way. That was kind of like a, an agreement they had. Yeah. She wouldn't act in other other directors' movies. She loved being a, a mother. That in an interview, she loved being a mother and married to Gastaldi, and kind of almost being like a script supervisor. Like she she read all of his stuff before he took it to any producers. Uh, they were a great team. Another thing that I found out she she also wrote Gialli novels under the name Mara Umbra, and that was kind of her livelihood between acting. She made some good money off of uh, off of her novels. But yeah, I just want to touch base because I watched the the bonus features on uh, the Severn libido release. And there's a great there's a great interview with Gastaldi. It's like an hour long interview, maybe even a little longer called I've got you under my skin. And he spends about 45 minutes talking about specifically the film libido and his career in film and writing. Uh, but then he spends about 20 minutes just on his relationship and his marriage with Mara Merrill. And it Aww. is incredibly sad. I mean, it's very, there's a lot, there's so much joy in it. But um, during the interview, uh, five year, I think it was five years prior, she had developed the Alzheimer's and she was going through like dementia. And, yeah. um, so it was it was very emotional. Uh, he was talking about, you know, missing her dearly, even though she was still alive. They had this very like symbiotic relationship, sharing everything with each other. Um, they traveled the world for, you know, 60 years when they were, while they were married, but they kept, you know, they traveled until she got really sick. Uh, he, he was like lamenting that it was, it was stupid of him to think that happiness could live forever. Cause when he was with her, he didn't. He never felt like he was in the, his twilight years. He always felt young around her, and then he realized when she got sick that oh well, this is not gonna. This is not gonna last. This happiness will never last. It was just very emotional. He said, be, like because of her, he hit her in her illness and made him realize that there was no such thing as a soul. Jesus, I know it was, and it kept going. And oh. I felt like, is this gonna end? I mean, I was obviously captivated, and it's a very emotional and and real interview. Yeah. It's some, it's unlike anything I've ever seen in, in special features with someone so closely attached to the movie yeah. that's released. 
but yeah, he was in, he, he's, I mean, he was openly saying that he had fallen into the state of existential anguish and that he hoped the situation didn't last much longer. And he would hate to realize that he may live to be a hundred, you know, going through this. And it was, I was just like, Oh my God, I'm, I'm dying here. Jesus. Um, and what made it even worse is oh god it gets worse yeah this is worse so oh god. that's the whole interview and cut to a black screen and it says mara died 10 days after this interview oh for fuck's sake and i'm like oh, are god. you fucking kidding me and then it starts rolling credits for the interview and i'm like i'm gonna i'll be right back i'm gonna go kill myself oh. like, <laughs> i i feel you gastaldi like this is a sad fucking world but I mean, compared to what he's going through and been vocalizing like during this interview, I was just so torn up. And obviously he is too, but yeah. very heartfelt release. I do think it's, I mean, it's, it's in it's interview on like I've ever seen. And I do think this, like I said, I think seven special features on their, on their releases are like top tier. Yeah. And it's reason for this. Like you're never going to see an interview like this, yeah. but I'm glad I got a warning. Cause so I, my living room is a fucking mess right now. Like I can't get to half of my movie collection right now because all the furniture is pressed up. So I know what's in there right now. So yeah. I didn't get a chance to watch that, but I'm glad I have a warning <laughs> ahead of time now. It's, I mean, it's, she's completely inspirational though. Cause she sure. has so much work behind the camera um, in this male dominated still, you know, uh, industry. Mm -hmm. She wrote books. There wasn't a whole lot of women writing, you know, jolly books or sci-fi novels. And, yeah. Very successful. They had one. I mean, it sounded like they had the happiest marriage together. So 60 years of that children. I mean, a, a wonderful life. Ernesto for Ernesto Gasaldi yeah. and, and Mara Merrill. But yeah, be prepared if you're going to watch this. Sorry if I spoiled a lot of this stuff from the interview, but there's so much more to this interview that you just, just pull out the tissues. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible. Okay, we're getting depressing here. Let's let this is getting too sad. Let's yeah. let's jump into talking about this movie. All right. We'll do that right after this promo from our network. You're listening to the Prescribed Films Podcast Network, home to hundreds of hours of free podcast entertainment. The shows on this network all have a common goal providing you with the best discussions about movies and other forms of entertainment media. The PFPN hopes to fill your ear holes with audio joy. Visit our website with links to all the other amazing shows at www.thepfpn.com. Thanks for listening. Okay, so I want to start with Screams in the Night. And getting, getting that one out of the way first. Okay. So that came out in 1981. Libido is what, 65? So we're 65. talking 16 years later. I'm pretty certain this was some sort of tax write-off movie. Because it's essentially the same plot. You have the same character names. You have Christian, Paul, Brigitte, and Eileen. Or Helene. Or, no, it's Eileen in that one. Mm -hmm. Pagosi plays the character plays a character named Paul. Um, Meryl plays character named Brigitte, and he's also playing like this estate guardian in it, um, right. or like a lawyer. And she's also his wife and sort of free spirited, ditzy kind of character. Starts with a murder of one of the characters' um, husbands, then flash forwards. Ten, like I think it's 10 years later, maybe eight. And it's the wife of the man who was killed, her current lover, and then this other woman who's all in love with the wife's lover. And then it's Paul and Brigitte. So it's five characters. So again, minimal cast. Right. And they have an appointment to go to court for her husband to officially get declared um, dead because the body went missing or something like that. Okay. You do see the death. So, like there's like a dagger that flies off the wall. So there's a supernatural element to it. Okay. Um, they, when they, so then all the characters end up in the forest and that's where the, pretty much the entire movie takes place minus the flashbacks to the night of the murder, which all take place at a house. So it's kind of a single location too. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of the scenes that are in the flashbacks are scenes from libidos. Right. Specifically, 
uh, Brigitte being tied up on the bed in the mirror room, but it's overlaid with, uh, with a red tint. So you can't tell, Oh wait, why does she look so much younger when that movie, you know, that was 15 years ago, but this, situation is only this many years ago anyway right. so there's a few scenes that are used there's a you know uh the same cliff um that's in libido and um you know character is getting pushed off of that so, <laughs> um paul actually gets pushed off of the cliff in this and survives oh yeah <laughs> yeah okay. so because the at the well, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I'm assuming if you're listening, you've watched Libido already. Mm -hmm. At the end of Libido, because uh, Brigitte is tied up to the bed, not dead, and we right. never see Paul's body, hypothetically, this could be considered a sequel or a what if movie. Right, like an alternate universe or right. reality. Yeah. So like saying both of those characters actually survived and here's another situation that they find themselves in where again, Paul is in charge of this estate until it can be handed over to the wife because the husband hasn't been declared dead. You know, there's, there's lots of other similarities too. Um, and especially like in the flashbacks, I mentioned the, um, her being tied to the bed, the cliff, the location. Um, there's a chess game that's being played by Paul and, and the wife. And, and then Brigitte is like overlooking them and asking like, Oh, why did you move that there? And that's, so it's nearly identical scenes in this. So right. it's pretty much like, Hey, we have that movie we did 15, 16 years ago. Uh, we need a tax write off. Uh, we're just going to go in the middle of the forest and uh, <laughs> we'll figure it out from there. And they try to add this supernatural element. There's this Pliny elder rock in it that they think might be, have some sort of spiritual connection to what's happened and is like fucking with them because like once they're in the forest, their car disappears and then they're not, they get lost. They're unable to leave. And then one by one, they start getting killed. I'm making this sound more interesting than it is. Cause it's really not that great. Right. right but right. It, I mean, it does sound interesting. Yeah. Though, you're but. probably going to, yeah. Well, I know I sent it to you, but the subs didn't work on yours, but I, it's, <laughs> it's, um, I think it's an interesting companion to libido to watch and, and, and see the whole what if scenario right. with it. And if you enjoy Brigitte as a character, you'll like this movie because she's again, the same personality, very bubbly, very like, oh, yeah, I guess what's Sta this? Yeah. Gestaldi said that she created that character, but she was very much that character too. Mm -hmm. Like she wasn't, you know, obviously she was very intelligent, knew exactly what she was doing, but that was typically her role in most of the movies. That's, that's interesting. I wonder if they even like reached to try to reach out to like Giancarlo Giannini, who was a superstar at that point or they, yeah. They so to. they couldn't get anyone at, at that point. Giannini was too big yeah. to be in something like a tax write off movie. Yeah. So that's essentially why they got the other characters uh, in this film for Does, that. Did physically, I haven't looked, I haven't even like looked at any stills or anything. Does he physically look at all or anything like Giannini? No. No. So yeah, nobody, nobody looks the same except Brigitte looks essentially the exact same way that she did in libido. <laughs> and then Paul has, um, or Pagosi has uh, a beard now, and, oh, but okay. it's like, it's just, you know, it's an older version of him, <laughs> you know, it's like, Oh, they've been together for 15 years and he's still a lawyer because he's maybe survived. <laughs> and he pushed off a cliff. <laughs> right. And that one's in color, right? Yes. Okay. But the the one I watched, the version I watched was a very, very bad copy, extremely washed out. So, oh. I mean, I, I say color in quotation marks. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. And libido, it's, it's, you know, to save money, they shot in black and white. And it has so many, it's funny to think that was called Screams in the Night, Scream, mm -hmm. uh, is, has more of a supernatural elements. Because I think Gastaldi, when he wrote libido, it works well because it almost feels like it is a gothic movie, a gothic thriller yeah. that may have some sort of supernatural elements like, you know, the ghost dad. Maybe the dad didn't die when he was when he committed suicide and he's the one coming back haunting this place. This feels very gothic horror to me, libido, not only with the black and white cinematography, the castle or the, the single castle, the villa location, the thunderstorms and the windy nights, the candelabras mm -hmm. and Gestalt, you know, he wrote. Crypt of the Vampire and a lot of he did he he wrote gothic horror so it's kind of this cool period where he's 
branching off into the more gialli and the thriller and the mystery of of his uh of his scripts but still kind of leaving the gothic element that he's in this and it, it's it's a cool little bridge i think between yeah between i like his, his career i like the mix between the two i i know that looking at it it doesn't feel like a or, or even watching it it doesn't feel like a traditional giallo I think it's interesting, though, because I, I think a lot of people just cling so much to certain elements of uh, of Jolly. And that's, you know, the colors and the high concept murder set pieces. Right. But to me, you know, the core of what makes a Jolly a Jolly is the murder mystery. In this film's case, the, the mystery of whether or not someone is dead or not. And I think a lot of people get so hung up on the colors or murders that they're, they'll assign the term to films that really aren't mysteries at all, you know, and I'm going to probably get rocks thrown at me, but I don't think stage fright is a Jalo because you know who the killer is the whole time. Right. Like the, and that to me is that's the first checkbox. And then everything else after that, you know, the murder set pieces and and like the, the colors and the, the sort of gauche design and all of those sorts of things follow that. But at its core, it has to be a, some sort of mystery. And it's like, I know who the killer is in stage fright. Why is, why are people calling this a Jalo? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that's, I, yeah, I think people are so hung up. You're right on the bright red blood in Giallo mm-hmm. and the black gloved murders and the, gr- the grizzly murders. Uh, there was a, it was on the Kat Ellinger commentary. She said that she'd read an interview with Gastaldi where, you know, they asked what was his opinion of Argento and like bird with the crystal plumage and he's he's apparently said he wasn't impressed with it. Hmm. Um, he felt it wasn't a giallo. He felt that gialli is all about like what you mentioned the 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 thrilling mystery. There's a mystery, yeah. And that's what he focused in on when he wrote his. He felt Argendo leaned too hard and focused too much on terror. Which I mean, I think the bird with the crystal plumage has one of the greatest mystery setups in the beginning. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't know if, yeah, I don't know if it was a success thing, maybe, you know, I'm, I'm sure, you know, obviously Argento has so much money to create his directorial debut. Of course. Whereas libido, he had very shoestring budget, like yeah. fighting for, you know, trying to get Enrico Maria Salerno and mm-hmm. not a lot of things falling through. But yeah, I mean, I, I do think people could even uh, shun libido because of, of it being in black and white. Yeah. Uh, you know, as far as Gialli goes, Gestaldi is the Severn Films podcast. They mm-hmm. were talking about this release for Black Friday, for the halfway to Black Friday. So, yeah. And they kept referring to him as the godfather of Gialli, which yeah. makes sense because especially in Libido, there are a lot of, you know, hallmarks that are used. The child's toy that plays the music, mm-hmm. that's used. Argento used that. I mean, the physical just toy that kind of pops up throughout yeah. that triggers memories and traumatic events. Yeah. I mean, there's just so many, I mean, obviously there's a lot of people fucking fucking friends and family over for like an inheritance. And yeah. that's kind of like the main reason. Yeah. I just, I, I love libido because it is a mystery from the start. There's multiple mysteries, you know, is the dad a ghost? Is the, the dad really die? Uh, are these people, involved in the Christian characters losing his mind, his mental stability. Yeah, I do. Uh, I, I, I like that with only, and that just shows how economic this film is, not just with like the budget and like physically what you can, you know, what they had to work with, but you know, the characters um, or the story that was written here and being able to have that much mystery with only four characters in here. Right. I do think that it felt a little bit padded in quite a few places. Shots lingering on people for a little too oh, yeah. long. And so a lot of camera work, just going down the hallway, focusing on a closed door. It's, yeah. Things like that. And even, you know, the opening quote, the Freudian quote, that was an afterthought. Okay. That makes sense because uh, I'm like, this movie's not, you know, you if you put a Freud quote at the beginning of a film, I expect a fucking horny movie, y'all. Like, you yeah. know, I, I and the movie is called Libido. Right. Come on. And and yeah, like, I mean, I took my pants off, but that's because John Carlo Giannini is in the film. <laughs> but so, yeah, the editing, um, 
I like the pacing of the film. It's very deliberate. It is very slow. I like, I mean, it's, I think it's, I love black and white cinematography. So, uh, and I know that was a reason, the reason it was shot in black and white was for budgetary reasons. Sure. I'm sure he would have wanted to use color. But when I read about the process of the editing for this film, I became even a little more intrigued and, and uh, impressed by it. It was handled predominantly by Ernesto Garcaldi, who used his pseudonym. I think it was George Money or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. And Roberto Cinquini, who did A Fistful of Dollars, uh, Crypt of the Vampire, he helped out with some editing stuff. And so filming for this, obviously low budget, 18 days. They worked long hours each day. Uh, they filmed it in 18 days. And when they completed the film, it was only 75 minutes long. Oh. But contra- contractually, they had to have a 90-minute film. Ah, uh, okay. So they went through all this unused footage, you know, Gastaldi with Cinquini and they reused a lot of shots. They did some rewind effects, you know, for flashbacks. They, they added all the, this extra footage, but they were still six minutes short when they were, did that. So they're like, okay, let's use some of these close-up shots of the characters during these conversation scenes. They edited in some of those shots. This allowed Gastaldi to actually add more dialogue on top of those scenes mm-hmm. to the script, which he felt helped with the plot and the story move along. And then when they were finished with that, they were still like a full minute short of 90 minutes. So Gastaldi wrote and he put together that quote, Sigmund Freud quote, which completely afterthought, he's just like, we just did that opening crawl and, and it's very slow and it's a minute long. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's really like when I, I watched, you know, I watched a little bit a lot uh, late last year. Uh, I watched uh, some of the commentary and then this interview with Ernesto Gastaldi, and then I watched it again, knowing that there are these close-up inserted shots, and you could really see it in a lot of the conversations where it's like there's the there's a scene where um, Christian's losing his mind and he pulls the gun out, yeah, you know, with uh, uh, Paul, and there's all this time of uh, Eileen just uh, kind of breaking down the whole story, like breaking down, like what happened and her and Paul are not together. And like, you know, you're talking crazy and it's just edited very oddly. And you could tell it's like all these reactions, but, and she's talking the whole time over these, uh, over these shots. And it, it, you could feel that, I don't know, you could just tell that they're very aware of the runtime and like, okay, this is, <laughs> this discussion is going on way too long. Yeah. But I did. I I enjoyed the pacing. It, it's a very swift ninety minutes. Yeah, it went it, 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 except for that opening crawl. Yeah, except for that. <laughs> yeah. So the ending. So Christian is literally pushed to the edge. Yeah. Like literally. Yeah. Like, and I think we all. I mean, if you've seen, if you're listening to this, you should. You, you've you've watched it. So there's so many twists and turns at the very end. I mean, that's where I really felt the pace pick up quite a bit. You know, the first 45 minutes or or so, I'm engaged. But It's very gothic. Like, it's just slow, not much happening. Yeah. You're just learning the characters. But, yeah, but once he starts becoming suspicious and, you know, following his wife and Paul, and then things start getting a little bit messier, yeah, it... It really picks up in the last half for me, and that's really what bumped it up for me, you know, ratings wise when I uh, when I first watched it. So, yeah, yeah, I, I think, and and I think one of the things that I really really love about it too is that it's nice to see a movie about a man being made to think that he's mentally unstable or being driven insane versus that happening to a woman, which is much more common. Right. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. That's why I think Giancarlo is, you know, I'm sure if Franco Nero was in this role, it'd be, I'd be just as compelled, but I think he's a perfect fit because he does seem, you know, he, he seem he does, he comes across as very fragile in this yeah. and like a little boy. And like, especially at the very end, you know, after he ties up Brigitte and leaves her to starve, he walks to the cliff and he winds up his toy and he like smiles down at his toy and he's just this lost little boy. And it's, yeah. It could work with Franco Nero. I, you know, I'm still blown away by that story. That's why I keep bringing it up. <laughs> but Janini, I think, is perfect, not just his mannerisms, but physically, I think he it, it works really well in this is him being uh, just a defeated, losing his mind, fooled man. Yeah. Eileen's quote unquote death 
when when they first show her her body and she's like strewn out at the foot of the bed. Yeah. Um, and she's got like that one bloodline across her mouth. My first thought was like, oh, she's faking it. And I was like, she's not dead. And then I'm proven right later. But my favorite part is when she reemerges and her oh, hair yeah. is just like <laughs> Bride of Frankenstein out there. And she just casually wipes the blood off the corner of her mouth. And yes. I'm just like, fuck yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love, I mean, the, obviously Giancarlo Giannini is a, a standout because of, you know, what he becomes later in his career and stuff. But I think the the roles of of Dominique uh, Bascaro and and Mara Merrill are stand out. I think Mara Merrill steals the show. I think whenever she spices the whole movie up, uh, I think it'd be a complete bore and even more kind of I think that 45 minutes would have felt even longer the first 45 minutes of that without her character. Yeah. There's just something about her that just brings so much life to break up those long scenes of cameras just panning out throughout the, the the villa or watching Christian slowly drink a bourbon, losing his mind. Right. I love the way she playfully shrugs whenever she does something evil or yeah. knows something evil is oh going to go down. It's so cute. She's just like, mm. yeah. <laughs> uh, when she's outside and like, she's like, I'm going to go get some sun. Ciao. <laughs> Ciao. <laughs> just like, <laughs> I love it. Uh, I love her character so much. I do. Th- I love the fact that her and Ernesto had a very, you know, long relationship. Yeah. They d- did seem to have an agreement that she would just act in his movies, which, and she loved writing, but I would have loved to seen her in other Italian movies. Cause I think she's a great actress. Yeah. She's very compelling. I can see how she might get a little grating to like, if, and and I'm I'm only saying that because I saw her play the exact same character in another film, right? And so you know her acting credits are fairly limited. I I didn't get into her other ones, but besides, uh, I already forgot the name of it. The beach the, one, the lone the lonely violent beach. Lonely, or? yeah. And uh, I adore her. I think she is just she's cute as a button. But I can see like some people being like. Ooh. Not, you know, not for me, if, especially if it's always that character. Right. Yeah. And the Lonely Violent Beach, she's, that one reminded me a lot of, uh, I think I watched it for June Exploitation or Horgas Back, uh, Long Weekend, that Astro- Australian movie. Right. Yeah. Where it's just this married couple that they're terrible people. They're very, you, they're obviously very unhappy and you hate them and they hate each other so much. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's what I got from, you know. Uh, the lonely violent beach, which was, it, w- it was an entertaining movie. Her character is a little different, but yeah. yeah, they, I don't think she had enough time. It's a short movie. They don't spend enough time for her to like really develop the character. She's just, you know, play a bitch, you know, and then yeah. the husband, you play a fucking asshole. Right. And those are your characters. Yeah. They don't really explore that, <laughs> but yeah, she's, uh, she's perfect in this role. That's yeah. for damn sure. Yeah. So would you recommend this movie? Of course. Pick up the Severin, watch this interview with Gastaldi and cry, apparently. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Um, yeah, hundred percent. It's it's you know, expand your jolly horizons, folks. You know, you, they don't all have to be bright and colorful and, and super bloody. You know, they can be like this too. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I, I don't know if I already said it, but I'm kind of glad that Gastaldi didn't go into directing more because it I, I maybe he wouldn't have stopped writing these wonderful scripts that for all these jolly and horrors, but yeah. uh, it's totally worth watching because, you know, quote, he's the godfather of jolly. Yeah. And it's cool to see it kind of start and you get all these hallmarks and uh, jelly tropes from it. I love black and white movies. I don't need the bright red blood. So, uh, I mean, I love it. But like you said, it's good to branch out and watch a lot of earlier stuff. Double feature pick. Yeah. What do you got? I think, uh, you know, I think – You'd be good going with anything along the lines of Diabolique, really, you know, anything. Obviously, where, heavily influenced, yeah. Yes, anything where characters are fucking with someone, making them believe that someone's still alive when they're dead or dead when they're alive, usually for their own benefit, because why else would you do it unless you're <laughs> just <laughs> fucking mean? I would do it. It's fun. Um, but I'm going to go with one that has a lot of um, overlap with libido and also for another reason because you know i mentioned earlier that you know the movie's called libido 
it starts with a Freud quote, but damn it, this movie is not horny. Right. So I want a horny movie. <laughs> okay. So I went with The Whip and the Body from 1963. Overlap here, it's co- uh, co-written by Gastaldi. It also has uh, Bigotzi in it. Same composer. Uh, it's about Kurt, who comes home um, after leaving for a long time to find out that his brother has married his former uh, lover um, at the request of, or the order rather, of the father. Kurt is then found dead, but then his ghost starts haunting the family, specifically his former lover, now sister-in-law, Novenka. So there's a lot of similarities plot-wise as well. You know, a character sort of thinking someone that is dead is still alive, sort of being driven insane by that. Gothic setting, of course. Um, Familial infighting. You know, and the ending is also similar in what happens to the main person who is being driven insane. So yeah, libido's title promises something horny. So I would play libido first as like, you know, here's your foreplay movie, folks. Um, And then within the body for when you're ready to get down to business. Hell yeah. What about you? (laughs) Yeah, so I thought, uh, obviously, I'm still completely fascinated by this connection between Nero and Janini. So I was like, you know, the third eye would work because it's a Mm -hmm. black and white filmed shot uh there's the young male character being sexually traumatized and just kind of losing his his mind both of them arguably overacting and just going for it yeah Um, but you know we did an episode on that so i'm not going to pick that okay Uh, it works it does work (laughs) and obviously like diabolique clouseau's diabolique is like a perfect fit trying to fool somebody into thinking somebody's dead when they're not actually but i'm gonna go with interabang which oh. from 1969, this okay. is something I had watched late last year too, when I was looking for Gialli January picks, uh-huh. uh, maybe I'll pick this later, you know, for another pick at some point, but uh, this one's directed by Giuliano Baghetti, And it's about a fashion photographer who goes to this small Island for a photo shoot and accompanying him is obviously a model, a beautiful model and his business wife, his business partner, uh, which is his wife uh, and then her sister. So it's, there's only four people in this cast as well. Mm. Um, while there, while they're doing the shoot, their boat conveniently runs out of gas. They receive a report about an escaped murderer who's on the run on the island and the police are searching for him. The photographer husband hitches a ride from a passing boat to go get some gas and leaves the three, three women left behind. Obviously the killer's going to pop up and the plot, it doesn't have a whole lot of, in common with libido, but this, it's a single location on this island and there, like I said, there's very small cast. So it all takes place on this beach that has this rocket jagged shore, very similar to mm-hmm. the exterior shots in Libido. The plot holds up really well, even with like these minimal characters and the single locations. It's surprising. Like when you're watching Libido, you're like, okay, I think I could figure this out because mm-hmm. there's only a few characters. Right. But it, it's just about friends and kind of loved ones, quote, uh, loved ones fucking with each other. It has wild twists, especially the last few minutes, very similar to Libido. You won't see it coming. It's, and that's always fun just to speculate with these movies. You're yeah. like, I'm going to try and find, figure this out. So it's even more entertaining when you have such a small cast and it kind of fools you and it, it pulls the rug out from under you. So I would go, like you said, I'd go with Libido first. But then I would go very do like a Wizard of Oz Technicolor transition because this is <laughs> very bright, very you know the the sunny beaches, uh, just vibrant colors popping off. And then yeah, and then I would go with Interabang. It also has a score by Berto Paisano, oh. who Patrick still lives, Arcana Burial yeah. Ground. Uh, this one's on YouTube though with English subtitles if you want to watch it. Nice. Okay, so let's bring on February 2023. All right, February. I spoiled this for anybody who watched the live stream I did with Ryan on Disconnected. So some folks already know this. My pick is The Demon's Baby from 1998. Yes. Uh, So I think most folks, I, I mentioned it last episode, I do have an essay in the upcoming Vinegar Syndrome box set made in Hong Kong volume one, specifically on the demons baby. So before that number jumps up past a thousand, when folks get their box set, I wanted to get this one in. And also this is one that I would have wanted to cover when I first watched it last year, I think, uh, or might've, might've been in 2021. I don't remember, but there was nowhere for folks to watch it. And so now that it's coming out in the vinegar syndrome box set, people will either have that 
typically vinegar syndrome movies do end up on Tubi. So eventually you can probably catch it on there if you're not, not picking up that box set, but nice. so the demons baby is directed by Kant Luong and stars Anthony Wong, Elvis Choi, Annie Wu, Emotion Chung. It's basically about a general who opens up a tomb that he shouldn't have. He releases a demon. The demon then impregnates all of his wives. And then two of the men who work for the general have to enlist the help of a Taoist priest to help exercise the demon babies. So it's not, you know, the the title is not wrong because all of the women are pregnant, but they ultimately only have to contend with one demon baby. So it's not incorrect. But I will tell folks that the first half, 30 minutes or so can be a little slow. It does mainly focus on a love story, but it's February. So why not? There you go. But the second half of the movie really picks up. If you're a fan of Hong Kong horror, I mean, this brings it. You've got stomachs opening up, tentacles coming out, flying demon babies, fetal soccer balls flying. I mean, it's <laughs> it's super fun. And I'm really looking forward to talking about it. I'm really looking forward to more folks getting a chance to see this one. Awesome. And if you haven't already, you should pick up that set yes. from Vinegar Syndrome. They, I think they just started shipping. So yeah, folks should be getting those soon. All right. If you're not already, you can follow this podcast on Instagram and Facebook at Unsung Horrors. We're still on Twitter for now, but we'll see how long how long I'll stick around for there. <laughs> uh, you can follow me on Instagram, Letterboxd, and Twitter at Hex Massacre. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram and Letterboxd at El Shivey. And links for all the stuff mentioned at the beginning of the show are in show notes, uh, including our recent guest spot on Cult Movies Podcast, my appearance on Disconnected's YouTube channel, and a link to the Indiegogo campaign all in there, folks. So pitch in if you can. Love you all who already did. Thanks, everyone. Bye. I have my father's son, and I have my father's son. His bed is made.
Hey, it's Death by Video. I'm Phil. I'm Kit. And I'm Graham saying welcome to our podcast full of merry movie mayhem. Ever wonder what an Irish kung fu movie would look like? It's called Fatal Deviation, and we covered it. Ever wonder what a movie about a thousand cats would look like? It's called Night of a Thousand Cats, and we covered it. And it stars Hugo Stiglitz. Listen to Death by Video to hear us discuss and dissect some of the weirdest, wildest, and wackiest films ever made. All this and more on Death by Video! Woo!